Okay, thanks everyone for joining. I'll put the link to the meeting minutes um, in the chat. We'll get started a little bit after the hour here. Um, thanks for joining today. Hi, thanks for joining. We'll get started at about five after. The Zoom chat should have a link to the meeting notes. You can add your name to the attendees list and any agenda items. Okay, it's five after. I think we can probably get started. So once again, in case you're just joining, um, I dropped the link to, link to the meeting minutes in the chat. Feel free to add your name 
this is the weekly meeting of the CNF working group. Uh, we meet every Monday at 1600 UTC. Um, before we jump in, is there anything that anyone would like to add, the, add to the agenda? Okay, hearing nothing, um, we can jump in. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the voting. Um, so thanks everybody that's participating. Um, does anybody feel, first of all, did, did anybody not receive a ballot and think that they should have? Okay, and second question, it, will anybody not be able to vote by tomorrow night and would need an extension on the deadline for voting? Hey, Bill, I put yep. the time zone next to midnight just so people are tracking. If for whatever reason they're cutting it to the last minute. Okay. Um, at midnight. Uh, Ah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is, so once we have the co-chairs elected, we can start um, the tech lead elections after that. Um, does anybody have any questions about the voting process so far? Anything that I can help them with? Okay. Um, if you do, please feel free to reach out to me on the CNCF Slack, super happy to help. Um, just trying to make it as easy and as transparent as possible for everyone. Okay, um, second one, um, we have a look from Erickson and he previously presented uh, Eno, which is I think the external network orchestrator at the TUG meeting. And now he's interested in putting together a use case for Kubernetes network orchestration. Um, so I'll give it to him to just give kind of like a quick update. Uh, let's say maybe like three to five minutes about what he's doing because uh, he wants to put together a PR and is looking for people to help out. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Yeah, so we presented you know that is the external network operator in the last telecom user group many of you might have joined that meeting as well and have gone through the proposal and the idea which we are kind of trying to float in this community and i had a follow-up uh, discussion with uh, over the email with bill and tal about how we can take it further and one of the suggestions which I got uh, is to write a proposal in as in like a, a use case. Uh, there is a template which is available in the CNF working group uh, repo. And we just followed the same notations and nomenclature and been writing the proposal. It will be available in a couple of days, one or two. Uh, in 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 the form of PR in the repo, but uh, so if if anyone would be interested to be as part of reviewer, please let me know. Maybe over the Slack or just in this meeting, I can add. I'll I'll be happy to add them as a as a reviewer. And yeah, that's it. I guess from my side. Cool, thank you. Um, so looking forward to that PR and the use case um, coming out. So if anybody wants to be added as a reviewer to the PR, um, please add your um, as GitHub handle to the um, meeting notes and I can add you there. So um, any questions about that or we can keep moving on. And thank you for the people that are volunteering um, to be reviewers for the PR. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, 
next one is the clarifying the chair's responsibility. Taylor, did you say something? Yeah, I was just going to ask if um, I think that one's going to be a pretty big um, use case and discussion. If a um, discussion item could be added to the GitHub repo that links to the PR so that we can um, continue that conversation. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff on email and um, in other Slack channels. And I think it'd be good if we capture more than what, what the PR is, the rest of the discussions. Could you create a new discussion on GitHub for this use case that you're gonna do a PR for? Sure, sure, I can do that, yeah. That would be a okay. good option, yeah, thanks. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay, so the next one is clarifying the chair's responsibilities. So this is a PR um, from Taylor, uh, essentially editing it so that it kind of clarifies that the chairs are for facilitating kind of the group's interactions. And we have quite a few approvals here. I just wanted to check in this meeting, any last comments with this PR, otherwise we can merge it. Okay, cool. So thanks Taylor for that PR. Um, the next one is adding the glossary to the contributing. This is my, uh, or this is this is Lucina's pull request. Um, so thanks for updating this. This is adding essentially just a link to this and the contributing documents so that as people come by and are wondering where they contribute, they can add to the glossary. I think this is pretty straightforward. And unless there's anything else, I'm quite fine with merging this one too. Okay. So thanks, Lucina, for that. Um, the next one is Ian on the call today. I don't see him, but um, in case people had missed this one, this is about the rules. Um, yeah, thanks, Lucina. Um, is about kind of how do we do how do we say what companies are associated with each other? This is out of the discussion about the voting rules too. Um, we have two approvals so far, I guess. Does anybody else want to like look at this or be added to the reviewers? I think maybe we wait another week until a couple more people have had time to look at it. So does anybody want to be added as a reviewer? I can just do this right now. Bill, can you add my name there? Yeah, that's Victor, right? Yep, thank you. Okay, cool, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, cool. I think much of it is, is clarifying, um, cleaning up more than anything and moving a lot of it into one shared area. Yeah. Um, the next pull request is around having a timeline for the interested parties just for the legal departments that want it to be more clear and people can give people deadlines. This is essentially a one line pull request. I actually don't know, is this gonna go? Cause Taylor, you pulled out the interested parties into a separate, um, into a separate file. Will this go into that file? Yep. That would make sense to me. What? Th that would make sense that it should go over. Of, of course, I think with okay. the merge, this would probably say um, something like go 
look at the file and then interested part. I I don't know why the um, subheader has not uh, updated, but yeah, okay, conflict. Uh, but th this is this is just saying that the interested parties can be added at any time. I think what needs to be added is to the sentence can be added at any time to the list and you point to the list. But the, but the statement still belongs here. I think it's one uh, sentence up, if you go back to that conflict. Yeah. Okay, um, above uh, each organization, yeah, right where it says each organization. So yeah. this is where the interested parties is. And then um, I guess it would go, if you wanted to put it maybe in in that paragraph yeah. right before any contributors. But that I, is about the that is about the elections. It is not about interested parties. So yes, I think what you need, it. Mm -hmm. you, I think you need a section on interested parties before you have a section on elections. And it should say that the, you can add interested parties at any time or whatever time frame you, you want to specify and where that list is. This is in the election section. This only says each organization shall have one vote. That's what it is, right? Yeah. But the definition then, of what is an interested party and how you modify it uh, needs a separate section by itself. Just a thought. Well, right now we've we've removed that what are interested parties and everything and I we've already said that we would like to um, look at changing the whole voting as well as representation so I, I don't want to do a whole lot of work on this um, I would say either remove it and just kill this PR for now or do something minimal like what you're doing um, Bill, you can put yeah. it in or. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Pankaj. Would you be okay if I. Um, that's, that's fine. That's fine. We, yeah. Yeah, add it as is and then add an issue that the election that's process okay. should be sure. separated yes. out. Okay. So. Is there still a conflict in here? Oh, did I do this the wrong way? Okay. And then, um, Uh, I'll add a note that we should, yeah, compile, um, so we'll create an issue for that. Cool. Um, Ian, I, I saw that you commented here about this. Yeah. Uh, really, it's not, um, I, I'm just saying my opinion, um, other people no doubt have other opinions about what a use case is. It shouldn't say, uh, a use case should not say, ENO is great, ENO does this, ENO is marvelous. A use case should say, here is an abstract problem I have to solve so that you can show that ENO is great by solving the problem in a separate document. Sure, yeah, and I took a note of your comment in the Slack channel and definitely we'll put along the lines as per your suggestion. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. fine. It, I mean, 
I guess I've got my skepticisms about whether Eno is right, but here's your chance to prove that you, you know, demonstrate it to me. Um, but I sure. don't want you to basically, if you write Eno is a thing that we will be using, then, then you don't really get the chance to prove how great it is. That, that's the yeah. thing I want to see. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if you heard Ian, but this, that, what you're talking about is uh, one example of why we need a, a GitHub discussion so that we can add more comments than just the PR. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would take either, but I totally sympathize with what you're saying. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say don't do it because you're doing it in academic, uh, in administrative slightly the wrong way, but you know, it just might mean that the PR doesn't get accepted, but, um, yeah, um, either way. Well, on this topic though, right? Like the use case should be network orchestration and should be like completely agnostic. Then a best practice using Eno would be a proposal, right? Like the, the whole discussion yeah. versus exactly. PRs, this and that, like, like what use case are we trying to fix? That's a PR. How are we gonna fix it? That's another PR. Mm. Yep. Oh, that's where I was going with that, yeah. And speaking of that, we do have one use case on the table right now. Um, so this is from uh, Vuk. Um, so this is about the what happens when you need to manage the infrastructure lifecycle and what happens to the CNF during that. Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey, I saw that you had a comments nine minutes ago, um, but we're also looking for more people to add some reviews to this. So is anybody else interested in reviewing this? And I think the, the process of like how this gets like approved and managed through, I think will become more clear once we have some tech leads um, that will kind of like help shepherd this along too. Bill, can you add me to the reviewer list? Yes, and I was planning on reviewing it as well. If you add me as a reviewer, I suppose that's a reminder. Okay. What is your what do we think a best practice yeah, would look like when it comes to the end of this? To ask the silly question. Oh, oh. Sorry. I think this yeah. is a use case, Ian, that would spawn multiple best practices, personally. Um, and so, yeah, I did a couple last minute. There was a few that I forgot to hit, um, submit my review. So that's my bad, Bill. But I did a pretty sizable commit. Like, I talked to Vuk and just did some, like, basic, like, editing and stuff. But I think there's a lot to unpack in this first one that book put up. I mean, mm. there's stuff around testing. I think there's best practices we should write around testing. There's best practices around like resiliency that could come from this based on like some of the um, things that book laid out. Um, yes. There's even like best practices. And I don't think we would necessarily cover this, but just like the interface between an app team versus an infrastructure team. Like mm. we talk, I know you and you and I have had a lot of conversations around um like what SLAs look like, what is like the mutual um, relationship between people building the app, people hosting the app, people running the app. And um, so, I, I mean, I don't know <laughs> if that was Volk's intention, but he, he put quite a lot into this first use case. Um, and so I think that once again, to the earlier comment about Eno is like a use case, you know, is in itself just something that we're doing and then one or multiple best practices could potentially, you know, try to address said use case. And in Volk's instance, I think it would take like almost a baker's dozen to unpack everything. Which is fine. I'm good with that. I mean, it seems to me that one of the more important things we'd get out of this is this is what you should expect the platform to promise you. Uh, or, or, you know, this is what the platform should promise, you know, however you want to, wh whichever lens you want to view that in. So which would be really useful. Having, you know, someone to actually declare the platform is this reliable and no more would be very, very helpful. Sure, and in reverse though, some of the stuff that Volk puts in there, and he's obviously coming from the bias of being someone who, you know, provides a platform is, these are the types of things that we need to do and we're expecting a CNF to be able to cope with them. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to write these down in the background um, so that we can get them. So I'll add these after the meeting because I don't think people want to see me do that. Um, so thanks for the people that have raised their hand to um, review that. 
um, definitely super helpful. I don't know if people have more comments about this use case today or want to have like a little, we can also, I think it might be helpful to have some more people look through it and generate some more discussion before we dive more deeply into it. Cool. Um, next one is creating a pull request template. Um, so this is an issue from Lucina, and we, something we might want to consider to help out people that want to contribute. Um, and so the type of PR, the description, the motivation context, and I, I think we can actually probably use like some of our, include some of our templates too. Um, so if anybody wants to take a first stab at creating like a pull request template, uh, looking for volunteers. If not, I'm actually also interested in this too. So um, I'll sign myself unless anybody else is dying to do this. Okay. I can help as well. Okay, thanks Lucina. Maybe I'll, um, I'll run something by you later this week once I have something. Okay, the next one, um, Ian, I hope you don't mind. I uh, numbered your BGP use case. Um, You're a terrible person. <laughs> I hope I didn't break anything. <laughs> um, that's fine. I, I have no problem. With that. <laughs> um, maybe if someone wants to just like look through it and make sure I didn't mess it up. <laughs> That'd be good. Uh, it should be pretty straightforward, but that's when all the accidents happen. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the next one is, so Taylor started out, he broke all the, um, the, the checks that we had, um, but now fortunately they're well, they're not green, so Ian won't be super happy, but he has a <laughs> draft PR because um, we've kind of, we originally talked about conformance, now we're switching to best practices. So if people want to like help out with this, um, feel free to jump into this too. Um, Taylor, I can't remember how it does and you'll have to read the documentation, but that obviously it's a link check to check for valid links and in a, in, drafts it may well be that you intentionally have broken links in particular um sorry in what am i talking templates you might well have broken links intentionally you don't want them to work um i think you can put exceptions in for them by putting a comment in the markdown but you would have to go read things i'm afraid yeah i think he probably broke some because it's changing the name of some of the files oh yeah that would do it yeah um but yeah, if anybody wants to help out with this draft PR, I'm sure Taylor would welcome the help too. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm trying to go through all of them. So if we, if we um, as I'm go, going through, I'm basically clicking on that branch, that rename conformance definitions branch, and then going through and updating all the docs. Uh, to fix links, like you're saying, Ian, um, some of it's going to be pointing to existing new docs and some of it is going to require renaming stuff like the um, the actual best practice name which is we have conformance definition proposal so that'll rename the folder and other things so I'm sure there's going to be lots of broken links and lots of wording that's still using the other language so yeah, anyone that wants to help, would, I'd appreciate it. So does this mean that CNF conformance, the repo is now CNF best practice? No, so those are two separate repos. So if I go to CNF um, conformance, this is actually a separate repo. Yeah, no, I, re I realize that, but if the, is the test suite 
still a conformance test suite or is it a best practice is it conformance against best practices i guess yeah exactly okay so i i wasn't bringing it up on this there are plans to um split up if you scroll can you scroll down bill yep to the readme until we see the actual content no you can keep scrolling oh, keep okay. scrolling there we go you're right so something that's confusing on this is um we're talking about the overall high level conformance program or the efforts to have um potential i guess we could say best practices but the overall program and efforts which would include maybe certification but none of that's there right now so we have this big program and then we have the actual software the test suite which right now is focused on best practices and giving feedback it, it, there's no certification so we're planning on splitting these up and that would be similar to the kubernetes conformance there's a repo and a whole conformance program that's completely autonomous and runs separately as far as like the governance and decisions around that from the test suite so if you're if you're looking at the kubernetes e to e test the decisions on what's you know covered and stuff in that that's done completely separate from the conformance which is a selection of the test and so we'll do the same thing around this and split it up and then it'll it'll be a lot more clear the cnf working group our focus right now is what are all those best practices that could be tested the test suite could test them and then a conformance program, if we move forward with all of that, would be saying, here's a way to say that, you know, you're you're following all these best practices. So it all come together. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Cool. Thanks for that, Taylor. Um, and then there's a couple formatting issues from Ian. I guess I know you created the issues. I guess, do you know of any solutions? Are these like things that we should just take note of and um, add to our contributing docs? Well, to be honest, it's got to go in the contributing docs before we put a check in. And the moment that actually gets done I'm a bit ambivalent about that um, line length one, to be honest. Um, the editor I'm using, and I'm guessing that it's, you know, Visual Studio Code, doesn't seem to like the idea of auto word wrapping things. It thinks that you should leave lines long and then it will word wrap things, but it makes the diffs absolutely horrible if you do that. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine a line length check is, you know, 100 lines of Python to actually make the check happen. So I guess we could write one in short order. I would prefer to make sure that it's not just my opinion on the subject before I actually go out and do that. Because otherwise I will be hated for making everybody word wrap their markdown because it forever fails tests, as opposed to everybody signing up to, yes, I will do 80 character markdown because I like your ideas. Um, I guess the question is why 80? Is it, not, is it an arbitrary number? Yeah, it was. It, it, it's just a number that, basically allows individual line diffs to work um, because that doesn't work right now. And again, you're welcome to tell me it's a really bad idea and you should never consider it again. I don't think it's a bad idea. I just think 80 is a bit short, that's all. But that's my- But only... you know, my, my, my green screen console only has 80 characters across. <laughs> oh. I'm not gonna comment on that. Regarding the tooling, Ian, if I guess, we were like sharing, the... if we were just writing, sharing stuff, I'm all for doing it on an old green screen and, and limiting it. At this point, though, for everyone else, I would say let the technology do the wrapping. Well, frankly, it's 
it can sit there, you can pass comment on it. it. You think of it as a very low level issue that we don't have to give any serious worry to. If it basically lingers around for another month and nobody really feels that it's compelling, then we'll just close it and be done. Okay. Maybe we should find a, an example of a, of a short and a long uh, line diff so that we can see what the readability looks like in, in GitHub. Because I think this is gonna come down to how well does GitHub show long lines? Like you have to scroll to the right because it's uh, because of GitHub's lack of auto wrapping or uh, does it allow you to show that in a really nice way? And, uh, and then we, it becomes a non-issue at that point for, for most of the users, though it may still affect people who review things in, in command line. But I think that that'll be, uh, that'll be a minority of users who can build their own tools to auto wrap and, and uh, try to work things out. Okay. Um, if you're really passionate about this, comment on the issue. I, I, I don't think we need to take a ton of time to discuss this. Today. Yeah, th th this is not our day job. This is just a nice to have that would make our reviews a bit easier. So don't really, don't, okay. don't knock yourself out over it. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Um, and yeah, Jeff, I also added that um, to the issue. So it's recorded. Um, the other thing is the web links and doc point to the GitHub location. Um, this is what, do you want things to be more like relative? Um, yeah, it just needs relative, relative links. Otherwise what's gonna happen here is any branch that you create will link back to the, the trunk documentation, the master documentation. So nobody will be able to review it as process markdown for one. Um, uh, forks repos, yeah, it, it just needs dealing yeah. with. But basically our links want to be relative and I don't think the link checker is clever enough to work that one out. Okay, so maybe this should be added to the style guide. So that's also, this is a really good first issue. Anybody wants to tackle that one? Um, uh, another one just related to that is also updating from master to main um, from like the GitHub thing, I guess, I haven't looked at, I haven't read into the documentation, but I'll probably do that later this week. Or if anybody else wants to or has experience, I'd love to hear kind of their experience, like switching other repos over. What are we trying to do here? Is switch the uh, default branch from master to main. Why? I'm, I'm up for taking that on. It's pretty, straightforward and we're trying to do that on all the other ones um like all the other uh repos do you have a link in there to the um yeah. cncf or uh, is it i don't know if it's cncf or lf naming uh no i can add that to you though i think they have something in there yeah, but this is the documentation from GitHub too. Yeah. Okay, thanks Taylor. Getting rid of language that's rooted in um, wherever problematic because of its background. So master would be one of them. And that's happened, I think multiple years ago for uh, GitHub. It just hadn't gone across all of CNCF. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Taylor. Um, Project, um, it looks like you 
recently opened a discussion 15 minutes ago. Uh, would you like to discuss? Sure. So the basic idea is to propose a bump in the wire, or actually I should say a hello world use case. And this is something that I had spoken about uh, a month ago or so here. And the idea is basically to put together a, a use case where we have an advanced use case, uh, which uh, Ian gave an advanced use case that we can focus on, but also to have a very simple use case that we can ask the question that as we're solving problems for the advanced use cases, are we overcomplicating best practices for a simple use case? And a bump in the wire firewall is uh, a possible easy use case we can focus on that, uh, that basically uh, serves a specific, uh, that, that specific role. And, and the idea was to basically have it set up as a, as a transparent firewall uh, there's other transparent things that we could swap firewall with as well, but I figured a firewall was understandable enough that pe most people who are non-networkers, if they're coming from an enterprise background or similar, they understand what a firewall is. They may not understand other forms of, of packet treatments that are that are there. And the transparent portion on this is descriptive of uh, a scenario where it doesn't modify the packets. It's uh, first, it doesn't modify the packets if it if it doesn't need to. Uh, but simultaneously, the more important part is that it's it's a is that it's not a rattleable thing. It's not like you're not able to address the firewall in the middle of the user plane, despite the fact it's still getting applied to the to the user plane itself. So in short, that's the, uh, that's the recommendation is to have something in, in that respect. Um, and other areas where this could be useful as well is when you start looking at like L2 use cases, then the, in L2, you can put in a bump in the wire ARP responder, or uh, when you're looking in some security products, you may decide to put something other than firewall, such as an intrusion detection system or some form of uh, data loss prevention. So in short, that's what uh, that, that's what this particular thing uh, try, tries to represent is that uh, bump in the wire firewall that lives within Kubernetes. Cool. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts? So I think this one will be interesting and tricky, um, depending on like how we describe the firewall and what the firewall best practices are. Um, I can tell you like this thing right here is something where non-CNS stuff, but just typical Kubernetes things. If you look at Vuk's use case around being able to provision new nodes and um, you know, taint nodes, migrate pods, all this kind of stuff, do upgrades, things like blue green and whatnot become really um, tricky <laughs> when um, you have legacy like firewalls as a bump in the wire, um, depending on how you pinhole. So, um, you know, like if you don't like, he's got a firewall controller there. So assuming you're doing everything programmatically, then maybe it's part of like a bigger workflow. But um, I think this one's use, this use case is interesting because it sounds very, very simple, but it causes heartache depending on how you provision things. Um, and it's like things that are uniquely complicated to Kubernetes versus how I would do things in a legacy, you know, way. So that's my, my comment. Um, I think that we say this is um, this is simple, but like you'd be amazed when you try to spin up 15 new nodes in a new subnet. And if your firewall team is not part of the cloud team, what does that look like to get those new um, prefixes added to the ACL? Like it, it can be um, be interesting. Yeah, I, I said simple, but I didn't say easy. So <laughs> I, I know this is a particularly uh, tricky use case for for kubernetes and if you're if everything is done through through cni you're just following cni policy then uh you're in good shape but the moment you try doing something that's outside of cni policy then uh, that's that's where these things get really really tricky and the kubernetes form of networking doesn't lend itself well to this form of transparent uh, of this transparent communication so 
uh, so I thought this was a, a pattern that it wasn't just going to be, oh yeah, we, we support it already, hit the checkbox on it, we're, we're good, but there's some, there's some, there, there's uh, definitely a gap here in terms of how do you achieve this within Kubernetes, but I think it's also something that it, we need to work out how to solve properly, because we're going to see this pattern appear over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. the risk is when we see other things that are created uh, in CNFs besides bump in the wire or firewall, we're going to see this thing reinvented over and over again. So establishing a clean set of patterns and working out when they do or do not apply around this use case, I think would be uh, would be valuable. Yeah, we, we should probably throw another use case or two at that service addresses or another one that crop up. So I've got a service. I have multiple uplinks. The uplinks have inter individual interface addresses and so on. Basically, it's the same. I've got more than one route on a link kind of thing that, that I think you're talking about. It, yeah, I, I agree. It's a perfectly sensible thing. Yeah, and this and this one doesn't cover additional advances on top of that. Like, what do I do about load balancing? Uh, what do I do about uh, uh, if I want to chain more than one thing? So there, there's still other complexities on there. But I figure we start something that's that's simple, and then we can work up the chain of complexity over time. Uh, but mm -hmm. definitely add it to either the the document. Uh, I've moved it. To to a suggest mode so we can track the, the changes. Uh, but if uh, you add it to the document or you add it to the discussion that's linked to um, that's linked to it, then I'll make sure that gets added to the document. And once we're happy with where the document is at, then I'm happy to convert it to Markdown and submit it as a, um, as, as a part of the repository. Yeah, one last piece on this too, um, just kind of, we'll pull together several points. Um, one is the concept that a CNF doesn't necessarily need to be a data plane intensive um, thing. So I can tell you like coming from like the service provider bias, um, we run things like network orchestrators and Kubernetes that have really weird and picky egress um, requirements, right? Like they need to have reached to certain parts of our network. So um, a best practice could just be um, egress gateways or um, you know something like that. Like, I think this is interesting because I think multiple best practices, which is another point we were discussing earlier, could um, spawn from this depending on the type of workload. So this comes back to um, the glossary. A, we need to define what a CNF is. Um, so that way we can talk about how a best practice you know, actually applies to it. And then B, um, I don't think a CNF is just what we typically want to like focus on, which is like some you know data plane accelerated, really cool, high performance network function and just simple things like um, I have a network function that has layer three requirements, which means that it actually cares about the node IP address as its source. So then if I have this transparent firewall in the way, how do I do basic cloud native operations um, when layer three is constantly biting me in the butt? Yeah, that, that makes sense as, as well. And um... This this also becomes very relevant when you start looking at some of the the five G use cases. Uh, when you look at the next generation of uh, uh, packet core that that's uh, they're trying to to create, and as we start to look at some of these things, like think some of the components around authentication and authorization are decomposed into multiple parts, and some of them are just this is a database that has state. And this is, uh, this is something that'll perform some authentication action for you. And then the result of those programs a, uh, a data plane somewhere. And so over, over time, like that, that thing can look like a, a bump in the wire firewall to whatever it is. It turns out to be a tunneling proto protocol or, or something similar, but to the, uh, but it still needs to be addressable in a way to the rest of the infrastructure so that you can still get that control and, and manipulation. And this is one of the reasons I, I try to avoid the term uh, CNF in, in the discussion was to avoid the argument about what is a CNF versus what isn't, but instead to focus on the heart of the matter of, of what's trying to be of what's trying to be solved. And one of the things we've done in the network service mesh community is we stayed away from the term, even though we, we use the term CNF, but when we start talking about it in a concrete area, we talk about things like network services, something that provides a network service or an endpoint, something that you actually connect to. And uh, multiple endpoints uh, can 
can provide a network service that you can then scale up those endpoints up or down, but they're all part of the same umbrella of network service, whatever you're trying to connect to. So, so I tried to use something along those lines as opposed to something that's a little bit more, uh, I don't want to use the term ambiguous because it, it, it's not really ambiguous, but it's something that they, there hasn't been uh, a clear definition around as to where do we want to draw the line between an application or, uh, or a component. And Victor just commented, uh, I suggest we start using the voting feature of the GitHub discussions to prioritize items like this. Yeah, so I'll about that too. Cool. Um, so thanks for kicking off that uh, conversation, Frederick. Um, it'd be great to have other people jump in too. Um, I think that's all we have on the agenda for today. Is there anything anyone else would like to bring up or discuss before we close for today? Well, Bill, the only thing that I, I was just thinking about is like the numbering of the use cases. Um, did you think that could be a good idea to keep numbers? Um, my, my concern is like, um, I don't know if, if eventually we can confuse like using numbers to uh, on on the use cases can reflect priorities or uh, misconfuse those things. Um, I mean, I, I, the other thing is like, which number you can give to a, to a use case when you have to multiple, multiple use cases at the same time, like the merge, the merge use, the, the merge number or like the the number that you use when you submit it or things like that. So I, I think eventually if we can avoid using numbers could be, could be better. I don't know. That's... On this point, Victor, um, we did say in the past that best practices would need to tie to use cases. I think it's safe to think that certain best practices could potentially tie to multiple use cases too. So some type of metadata is, um, probably warranted so that way we can have some mapping um, and maybe like use cases and best practices get updated with like a little table at the bottom that say what they apply to. I don't know, that might be overcomplicating it, but um, the big thing is, is like, you know, I look at a use case and I'm like, okay, how do I solve this? What What is the metadata that leads me to the best practices that would help me overcome the challenge, especially if there's not a singular best practice, but maybe there's multiple ways that the group at large deems is valid, you know, means of solving it. We probably want to plan for that. Okay, so so you think that using like a number we can group or at least I don't I don't I don't know if that's the right way or not. Like a, um, I just know that metadata so that we can track what goes to what is at some point going to be relevant and. The longer we go without it, the harder it'll be if, you know, we have lots and lots of stuff that we then start saying, how do we map all this together? Yeah, I guess we originally started giving numbers because it's something a lot of, like in Kubernetes, the caps are all numbered too. Um, just, yeah, to make it easier to keep track of. And in terms of like merging them, uh, I mean, if we're having like hundreds at once, it might be a problem. I think at the scale we're at right now, um, we can still kind of keep track of the numbers. It, I mean, if Kubernetes can keep track of the numbers for caps, I, I think we could probably can too. If we find it's a problem, um, maybe we rethink what we're doing. Yeah, I don't think it'll be an issue with merging, Bill. I think it's just, um, you know, let's say I have four different ways to solve network orchestration. Like how do I know which best practices I could go and look at to figure out like the one that I think yeah. best suits my use, like my flavor of the use case. Like I don't think we're gonna have to worry about merging or this and that. It's more just, you know, how are we gonna map use cases to best practices? And um, they, they, you know, they have file also, names. 
file names are unique. Robbie had started on that. But, um, Jeff, uh, Robbie had started on that with the document around best practices. And I, I think when it gets to a point where we're saying someone is interested in finding best practices, they can go maybe the what the route you're saying, Ian. They could just look through, but hopefully we have hundreds and that may be too much. So they may go, let me go into the document and I want to go down to a category. And then you say, oh, there's two options listed or four options to solve this problem. Let me read on all of those and then I'll pick the one that fits me the best. So yeah. we can organize it, I think, as they come into place. I don't know yeah. if this is this it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Know, that's, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, I guess Victor, that's a good point. Like, how do we want to map it kind of to this? So if you have any ideas, um, it'd be great to hear them yeah. for a better way of doing it. And and with the the idea with the best practices, every best practice should link back to a use case. So if, if you're going in that way, but you could also do the other way. We could we could always update a use case and reference best practices that have been adopted. So we, we can point to those and do a PR against an existing use case, maybe make a section on those and, and point to one or more uh, best practices. Yeah, I don't think we have to solve it right this second. I was just saying at yeah. some point, like looks, looks PR, like I said, is going to spawn multiple best practices, I think. So yeah. then making sure that there's some type of mapping to all the ones that come around platform lifecycle management, et cetera. Um, and yeah, even if it's just retroactively, like there's just a list and you just put the links in, I don't know, or file names to Ian's point, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm just saying, um, assume you're not someone who regularly frequents these calls or works in Git with us and you come in because you want to figure out how to do something, right? Um, that should be like our target audience that we're really trying to make this consumable for. I, I, um, I agree and, and maybe it's going to be multiple target audiences. Just someone that's actively doing very specific development may come in and go, I'm looking for this one type of thing. They may go right into the best practice list. And then someone else may say, here, what's the closest use case? So I, I think we need um, you know, the big specific list as well as the higher level. And maybe even another one would be if you have a list of use cases that we don't have but are kind of related, because some of the, the topics, including uh, what uh, Frederick was talking about for the, the inline firewall, there can be more complex ones. So if someone's coming in and saying, here's the type of thing that I'm having problems with, and then find their way down to what we've written is, is the most important. So the other thing that I was thinking is like, this seems to be like a change in the template. So maybe we can, I mean, if the new use case are not at least having a one best practice, uh, I don't know if that makes sense to include as part of the, the best practice, right? I mean, just talking about the, the, the new the new use cases has to at least has one. Yeah. Best Wait, sorry, can you say that again? Victor, are you still there? Yep, sorry, what, what was the question? Oh, sorry. Um, can you just say, say that again? Or did you? Oh, no, no, the only thing that I was saying is like, uh, maybe we have to modify the, the template that we have it, and yeah. probably include a, like a section where we uh, need to provide the best practice, which is implemented in the new use case. Yeah. The way, 
yeah uh, we, we can correlate things okay yeah so maybe that's something to think for the future how we like coordinate them together cool um so we are at the top of the hour i don't want to go over um just a reminder if you haven't voted yet please vote by tomorrow at midnight pacific um any questions please feel free to reach out to me otherwise thank you for joining today and have a nice week Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy Monday, everyone.